Well, having uh, listened to Eamon, or, or uh, Eamon uh, reviewing everything that you have been through over the last few months, then one wonders why we are here. Um, so thank you very much for the, for the introduction and the, and the welcome uh, to be here and to make some observations uh, as to how I respond to some of the things I have heard and to talk about then and uh, since then and now and well, you have to be careful about predicting the future uh, because there's always uh, possibilities that the future will never work out as you actually think it may work out. So some caution is uh, necessary. Now, I've been to some of the lectures, but I haven't managed to get to them all. But I have been to many other events uh, that are associated with this centenary uh, of this decade of, of centenaries. The Contemporary Christianity is sponsored a play by Philip Orr, which explores the impact of the signing of the Ulster Covenant and the formation of the UVF and the National Volunteers. And that's been presented at many venues uh, with cross-community audiences and subsequent discussions. And Philip also wrote a book called New Perspectives, which looks at the events of 19 and 12 to 19 and 14 as they played out in the unionist and national communities around Palamina. And it's been quite interesting to read what he wrote about in a quite small geographical area and how it affected the people there. And having read that book, I thought that really the community was on, on a knife edge whenever we got to September 1914. And had the First World War not been declared, it's hard to know what might have happened uh, in Ulster in particular and maybe in the whole of Ireland because you could have had a different kind of civil war and a different kind of conflict altogether. So I'm indebted to the historians who have unpacked masses of, of this material, and I am not a professional historian. Um, so um, I'm making this, these few observations uh, from my own perspective of how these matters uh, have uh, struck me. And what more pertinent time to do it than on the eve of the handshake of an alleged uh, previous commander of the IRA, uh, a leader in Sinn Féin, and the Deputy First Minister shaking the hand of the Queen, and the Queen in turn shaking the hand of an alleged previous commander of the IRA, a leader of Sinn Féin, and Deputy First Minister. This is quite a challenge for two people and not for one alone. So tomorrow, this event will take place. Uh, on, I, on Saturday, it was alleged that no photograph would be taken. I'm told that the policy may have changed and there may, in fact, be a photograph of this handshake. There are certain iconic events that happen that really do need to be photographed. Uh, and I think it would be a pity if this one was not, in fact, photographed. So that we would not only uh, actually hear about it, but we would, in future generations, be able actually to, to see the thing happen. I believe that the challenge which we faced in, in Ireland and still face to some degree is in the democratic process. How do you respect the will of the majority while at the same time protecting the rights and the interests of minorities? And that is a challenge, as Eamon has said, that you have to some degree uh, analysed in the past. How do you do that? The Arab Spring may in fact turn out to be a Christian winter for Christians because no one is yet sure how this Arab Spring will actually work out. If you get militant Islamic governments who may not respect the rights of Christian minorities. So therefore a concern for democratic government has not only got to do with majorities, but has also to do with the rights and identities of minorities. And the apparent self-evident ideal of the right to self-determination is not just the right to self-determination of majorities, but that must be balanced by the rights of minorities. And that uh, issue has been creatively uh, addressed in the Good Friday Agreement in terms of uh, concurrent referenda in two jurisdictions requiring a majority in both before the constitutional position of Northern Ireland would be changed. Ray Helmick, who is a Jesuit who works in Boston College, has spent a long time in Northern Ireland listening and analysing and creating environments conducive to understanding. And he wrote concerning the anxieties of the Protestant minority in Ireland in these terms, the environment of clerical domination of Irish life, 
dread of that power led the Protestant people to look in the first instance to defend the rights of dissenting non-conformist minorities. And being afraid of Rome rule, Rome rule, they did not extend their hands generously to their Catholic neighbours. Being afraid that if the dissenting tradition was not protected, it would disappear in an environment which was centralist and authoritarian, or in one where the dissenting tradition would be consistently outvoted in a democracy which was intent on imposing policies at variance with dissenting notions of liberty. When it comes to the signing of the covenant, I find that my maternal grandfather signed it in Uri, and my paternal grandfather apparently did not sign it in Balamoni. That may be because he came under the influence of the Reverend J.B. Armour, who was the, one of the two Presbyterian ministers in the town of Ballymoney, who had been active in the tenant right movement and who promoted the alternative covenant in favour of home rule. On the other hand, things may look quite different from the Presbyterian solidarity of North Antrim with the more insecure re realities of Newry and South Down. So I don't quite know why these two grandfathers of mine signed or didn't sign this covenant. Those who did sign it were concerned about economic issues, about religious freedom, and about their citizenship within the United Kingdom. I suppose we could judge economic well-being being reflected in shifts of population, and Eamon has said something about that. But I discovered in reading bits of Brian Walker's new book, A Political History of the Two Irelands, that while we know that the Protestant population in what became the Republic of Ireland fell after partition, and increased in Northern Ireland, and that for a number of reasons. Also, the Catholic population in the Republic of Ireland also fell between 19 and 26 and 19 and 61, the pop Catholic population falling by nearly 78,000. And in Northern Ireland, in the same period, the Catholic population increased by almost the same amount. So I found that interesting to discover uh, that, that th those particular statistics, and, and one wonders why? But when we come to the Celtic Tiger, then large numbers of people came back home and many new immigrants uh, came into the country. And the present economic crisis is leading to emigration again, and this in both parts of Ireland. Now, on the religious freedom issue, uh, the Protestant community were concerned with the influence of the Catholic Church in a society where the majority were Catholic. And you have previously in another lecture uh, explored the neotemery implications and how that impacted on the Protestant community. Uh, Donald, all of this happened in, in, the, in the years before the Second Vatican Council. And those of us who live in post-Vatican II have to be careful about judging the situation in pre-Vatican II because the two situations are in fact not the same. Uh, bishop Donald Lamont, who came from Bally Castle and who was uh, a bishop in what became Zimbabwe, uh, talked about the frozen misery which existed between the two religious communities prior to the Second Vatican Council and how Vatican II began to uh, warm up the relationships and the frozen misery began to melt and the relationships became much warmer. I think the issue of identity uh, for me remains a very important issue. Much of significance was gained for Irish people by independence uh, but I think mainly culturally and politically. And the great gain was a sense of self-worth and personal dignity and being equal with the British government eventually in the European Union. The right to be oneself, not to be defined and looked down upon by someone else, is a great gain, even though people might judge that the economic cost which came with it might indeed have been worth it. But there is such a thing as double belonging. There is such a thing as hyphenated identity. There are Irish Americans, there are Ulster Scots people, and it is possible to be both Scottish and British, although if the Scots vote for independence, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, and to what degree the, 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 the argument coming up to the referendum is anti-English rather than anti-British. So is Britishness, is Britishness sufficiently flexible to accommodate diversity? or is it not? There were people um, prior to partition uh, who lived, end up living in what became the Republic of Ireland, who undoubtedly had a quite distinctive double belonging. 
a hyphenated identity, which was both Irish and British. But then after partition, uh, the Britishness of their identity, I believe, had to be suppressed. And the price of belonging was to keep your head down and to keep your mouth shut and lead a private, more or less private, existence. I think they received some satisfaction when the Queen came to the Republic of Ireland last year. And after a long time, it seemed OK to affirm the British element in their identity, even though it had long been suppressed. Not that they would fly the Union Jack with the Queen being in Dublin, but they might have quietly smiled in satisfaction uh, that the visit went off very well. And in many ways, uh, managed, I think, to exorcise some of that bitterness. Following partition, we ended up with two unsatisfactory states, one Catholic nationalist and the other Protestant unionist. And both were exclusive and excluding, neither honouring their minorities properly, Northern Ireland becoming a cold house for the Catholic minority. And we heard from Tom Hartley about the experiences of the Catholic community in Belfast in the early 1920s. I was interested that, that Eamon mentioned the grievances of the 1960s. For me, 1960s was the, most, the 1960s were the most de hopeful decade of my life. I think the next 1960s were full of possibilities. The Vatican Council had finished, John XXIII died, the Unionist administration in Belfast flew the Union Jack at half-mast in the City Hall in honour of, of a Pope. Seemed extraordinary. All kinds of things seemed possible to me in my 20s. Uh, in the 1960s, and it all fell apart at the end of the 60s and in, into the 70s. And we entered into a very, very dark time. Reform being opposed on the streets by Ian Paisley and others, who has late in life been converted. And it's better to be converted when you're old than not to be converted at all. So one applauds the change in the man's thinking. But then, in, in Martin McGuinness, a change has also taken place, apparently. Maybe as radical a change as the one with Ian Paisley. In the 70s, I believe the IRA took the opportunity to resume what they believed their ancestors had left undone. And so we come through this very dark, tragic and terrifying time since 1970. In my book, much of it unnecessary, ill-conceived and disastrous which had disastrous consequences for thousands of individuals and also families. But also, in fact, for certain minority communities inside Northern Ireland. And being a Presbyterian minister, I have a particular interest in the way the Presbyterian minority community has been largely destroyed on the city side of Derry and in Newry. And the IRA must bear a serious amount of responsibility for the consequence of their activity. In Derry City, on the city side, in 1968, there were five vibrant Presbyterian congregations with 1,051 children in the Sunday schools and Bible class. And last year, those five congregations had been reduced to one and the number of children for over, over 1,000 to 54. And in Newry, two vibrant Presbyterian congregations in 1968 with 370 children in Sunday school and Bible classes. And last year, that had come down to 67, a loss of 303. Now, that is evident of the way in which a community has been seriously weakened. And communities required of a certain strong cohort of people in order to be sustainable. And one wonders whether there are a sufficient number of young families, either Protestant Presbyterian families on the city side of Derry or indeed in Newry, to sustain those Presbyterian congregations unless less growth comes from someplace else. So then we come to the, the ceasefires, the, the Belfast Agreement and the convoluted and complicated negotiations which went on in order to reach that accommodation. I call it a political accommodation. I don't call it reconciliation because we're not there yet. It may be that we will continue in this process of, of accommodating one another, of affirming the significance of one another, and we will eventually get into a much more reconciled place than we are at present. But at least we have to celebrate that we are in a very much better situation than we were a number of years ago. After the massacre of Nanjing in 1937-38, in those two month, that two-month period, when 300,000 people were murdered, by the Japanese army in that city. 
We might agree with the historian Irish Chang, who wrote the book The Rape of, Na Rape of Nanking, when she said that civilization is tissue thin. And whenever one considers some of the horrendous things which have been done in this part of the world in the last 30 years, we ourselves might think that civilization is indeed sometimes tissue thin. And therefore, we have to be very careful how we go about managing change, lest the unbelievable happens again. Because for me, in the 1960s, I did not believe could not conceive that we would ever go through the dark days which followed the end of that decade. So therefore, let us learn from these, heart term, uh, these really serious events that we've lived through and be careful. The three elements showed considerable improvement. The East-West situation between uh, Ireland and Britain is vastly improved. The North-South relationships are very much better. The internal relationships inside Northern Ireland are constantly being transformed. And for all of that, I am pleased and hopeful, and I welcome it all. And uh, it remains, I think, for the historians of the future to tell everybody what actually happened in the last 30 years, because we're not too sure what actually went on. Thank you. <laughs>